Thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. And sincere thanks to Auntie Leanne and Uncle Jade for that powerful um, welcome to country, um, reminding us, I think, of our the expectations, as Auntie Leanne said, on us as um, uh, visitors to this land in many ways. Um, I'd also like to pass on uh, Professor Rennie Leon. sincere apologies for not being here tonight. As I'm sure many of you know, she is a lawyer and was particularly interested in uh, attending this talk, but unfortunately, COVID has um, come in the way of that, uh, but I believe she will be um, zooming in um, to listen. Um, in her absence, it is my great pleasure to welcome the Honourable Michael Kirby and his husband, Mr. Johan von Floten, to Bathurst and to Charles Sturt University tonight. I would also like to acknowledge and warmly welcome back Vice Chancellor Emeritus Professor Cliff Blake and Mr. Stanley Compley. Michael Kirby is a very well-known name in this country. He's a national treasure. Michael continues to make a remarkable contribution to society after a distinguished and ongoing legal career as a lawyer, judicial officer, law reformer, arbitration lawyer, protector of international human rights for the United Nations and the World Health Organization, prolific author, speech maker, lecturer nationally and internationally, and advocate for LGBTIQA plus rights, and HIV AIDS research organizations, and as a patron of the Qtopia Sydney Queer Museum. Educated with a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws, and Bachelor of Economics, and a Master of Laws First Class Honours, Mr. Kirby was admitted to the New South Wales Bar in 1967, and was the Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission from 1975 to 1983. From 1975 to 1984, he was also the chairman of the Australian Law Reform Commission. In 1983, Justice Kirby was appointed to the Federal Court of Australia. He was president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal between 1984 and 1996, and the president of the Court of Appeal of the Solomon Islands in 1995 and 1996. Appointed to the High Court of Australia from 1996 to 2009, Michael's judgment and work on that court are well known and influential for law students, academics and legal practitioners alike. Some of his powerful dissents, in the words of barristers and academics Ian Frankleton and Hugh Selby, should be characterised correctly as ahead of their time and appealing to the future. Justice Kirby's work on a number of counts shaped all areas of law and represent among the finest examples of judicial interpretation in Australia and elsewhere. Beyond judicial work, Michael Kirby continues to use his formidable legal skills to national and international benefit, including being appointed as the chair of the UN Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights Violations in North Korea and in maintaining an award-winning international commercial arbitration practice. Michael has fond memories of travels to Bathurst from Sydney over the years and has had connections to many Charles Sturt campuses, staff and students for which we thank him. Lectures have included the annual lecture in honour of Professor Bob Mayen, former Dean of the Faculty of Education, lecturing in Wagga on theories of judicial reasoning and visiting Albury and Bathurst to engage with business law students and staff as well as the staff of the Centre for the Law and Justice, as he is generously doing again this week. It is a great honour to welcome such an eminent Australian to our campus and to the podium tonight. Please welcome the Honourable Michael Kirby. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Brown, for that warm uh, welcome. Uh, I'm very proud to be back here again, uh, and I am looking forward to a wonderful graduation ceremony tomorrow when I will have the great pleasure and honour of receiving the honorary degree of doctor of this university, uh, which is a... Uh, it's a great uh, privilege for me and also for my partner, Johan, who's here with me tonight. Uh, I, uh, like all of us in this room, honour the Wiradjuri, uh, and the people of the First Nations uh, and uh, reflect upon the injustice that has been done to the First Nations people uh, and remind you that some of the most important steps that have been taken 
to go beyond formalities and to provide uh, real legal rights to the First Nations people have been done not by our elected parliaments, which are amongst the oldest continuous parliaments in the whole world, but by our courts, and in particular by the High Court of Australia in the great Marbo decision and in the WIC decision. Um, I had not been appointed to the High Court when uh, the Marbo decision was made, uh, but I was there uh, when WIC raised the question of whether the principle of recognising Indigenous rights in land extended to uh, the um, pastoral leases, which cover a huge amount of the territory of the Australian continent. Uh, and the High Court of Australia, in that first few weeks of my service, uh, divided on that question, uh, and it divided 3-3. Three, three. And I, uh, who had just recently been appointed, had the casting vote. Uh, and I uh, cast my vote by holding that the uh, principle in Marbo, uh, propounded by the High Court of Australia, expressed most clearly by uh, Justice Brennan in his reasons, uh, also applied to the pastoral leases. And that was a very important decision for the point of spreading the Marbo principle uh, around uh, to more people and ensuring economic equity without which many of the other equities will not be achieved. Um, I'm uh, very pleased especially to note the presence here tonight of Professor Cliff Blake. He was the true founder of uh, this university. He played a leading part in um, tertiary education. He was the head of a number of colleges of advanced education, and then he led them marching into amalgamation to become uh, the Charles Sturt University. And he was, as you've heard, the inaugural vice chancellor, president of the university. And he is a very great Australian. He preceded me in the receipt of the honorary degree of uh, doctor of the university. Uh, he was an extremely distinguished scholar in agricultural science. Uh, and um, he won the university medal uh, when he got his original degree. Uh, and I'm very jealous of that fact because I, I did pretty well, but I never got a university medal. And uh, it's a wonderful thing that uh, Professor Blake, from the beginning of his career, has been a true scholar and a leader and a great Australian. And he's here tonight with his partner, uh, Stanley, and I honour him. And I'm very glad that they have come along tonight. Um, I regret that the Vice-Chancellor, Professor René Leon, uh, is um, down with COVID and not able to be here tonight. Uh, if she is there at the end of the AVL, uh, as I hope she is, um, I send her greetings and best wishes from one lawyer to another. We've got to stick together, the lawyers, uh, and um, I'm very sorry that she's not here, but we will find another time before too long for me to return to CSU and to honour her and to express personally the thanks I have for the honour that I will receive tomorrow. <clears throat> Now, uh, my partner, Johan, um, has been with me for 55 years. I think that deserves a big round of applause. <laughs> and um, very soon after I was appointed originally to the Arbitration Commission, a very important post uh, in Australia, uh, I had to get completely on top of industrial law. I had practised 
in part in that area, but I had to make sure that if any any lawyer threw a point at me, I would be able to deal with it immediately and knowledgeably. And so uh, with Johan, I uh, went on the weekends uh, between the time of the announcement of my appointment and the time of taking it up and thereafter uh, to spend the weekend with Johan and his parents. Uh, we had then been together for only a, a mere fleeting moment for four years. And so in the back of the parents' home, I studied all the details of industrial law and the Conciliation and Arbitration Act of the Commonwealth, 1904. And uh, his parents, as it happened, uh, had uh, started living in Wellington, New South Wales. And accordingly, we would drive up at the end of a busy week on a Friday night um, and uh, we would drive through Bathurst. Uh, and in fact, uh, members of his family lived for a sh short time in Bathurst. They lived longer time in Dubbo uh, and uh, some in Orange. And the result was that they were really people from this part of uh, Australia, although they, like Jan, had started out in uh, the Netherlands and, in fact, um, had gone through the war, a very hard time in the Netherlands uh, with the German occupation, and uh, Jan decided to come out here and uh, his mother and father came out as well they are wonderful people, and they are in my mind tonight as I speak to you. Um, and uh, we passed through Bath so many times uh, as we did this afternoon, and we never thought we, uh, if an angel had alighted on my shoulder and said, you will come back here in May of 2024, and you will be receiving a high honour from the university, I would never have uh, believed it. And therefore, it demonstrates once again the uncertainty of life uh, and the wonder of life and the opportunities that we all have uh, to share in the rationality of the human species uh, and to make a contribution uh, in our own country, in our own region and district, but also internationally in this age of nuclear uh, weapons and climate change and all the other problems of the moment uh, to make the world a better and a safer place. And that is an obligation of all human beings, but a particular obligation uh, of uh, those who have had the blessing of uh, education uh, in a country like Australia. Um, Every night, uh, Jan and I watch the latest doings of uh, President Trump, former President Trump. Uh, and uh, if I say to you that it's a slightly upsetting thing, you'll understand. I mean, I'm not immediately affected by it, uh, but all of us are very much affected by the President of the United States of America. And therefore, sitting there watching on YouTube the latest uh, events uh, of Mr. Trump and of his uh, trial uh, and of Stormy Daniels and all the others who are appearing in those cases, um, we always watch it for a time, but we then switch the television uh, to the YouTube uh, records of the planets. It's a healthy corrective to the uh, travails of our world and the dangers of our world to see uh, how amazing it is that the human mind um, sought to understand the universe and sought to understand the Milky Way and sought to comprehend the galaxy 
and to look behind our galaxy to the other galaxies and all the wonder of the universe, in a, the universe at first, and the massive uh, size and dimension of it, it really puts the problems of the world in perspective. And if you don't, if you haven't seen this, I do urge on you that you'd look at YouTube with the images of Mars and the images of the other planets. It's, it's wondrous to see them and to see that this has been achieved by human beings and by universities and scholars and scientists to send uh, instruments to these far off planets uh, and to um, understand the enormity of space and of the universe and of our duty as human beings to um, respond more sensibly to the dangers that we face. Um, and Yohan and I have come to the conclusion that one of the solutions to the problems of our world would be to take Mr. Putin, to take uh, Mr. Trump, to take Mr. Biden, to take President Xi, uh, and maybe we'd throw in Mr. Albanese and a few others into a locked room so that they are forced to sit there and see the wonder of the universe and how trivial in comparison to that are the problems that they are so preoccupied with and raised to the danger of all of us and danger of human life and human beauty and human music and human love. Uh, that would be a good curative, in my opinion, for the ambitions of a few politicians. Um, now, um, Professor Mark Nolan, who must be the best responder to emails that exists uh, in Australia, uh, and who is uh, must be sitting there, um, uh, acting Vice Chancellor Brown, he is sitting there day and night, slaving away. And if I ever send an email to him, he's uh, hot on the button and back comes uh, his response. But he wanted me to come here tonight and talk about the issue of international commercial arbitration. Now, that is, shall we say, a very important subject and a very uh, interesting subject, and it's one that I know a bit about because I've been involved in international commercial arbitration. I'm sure there'd be a few lawyers here who'd be interested to hear about it, uh, but it's not, shall we say, an issue that would be of great abiding interest to uh, a lay person. And lawyers have got to learn to speak to lay people and to speak about their concerns and their issues. And so I plucked out of the air um, uh, uh, the topic of the retirement age of judges. <clears throat> uh, as I have long passed retirement age of judges, but I'm still very busily at work, I thought I should reflect upon that and explain to you what happened in Australia to change our constitution and change our law and to demonstrate that contrary to all rumours uh, that it was impossible, Australia's, Australians sometimes have changed their constitution. And in fact, the very last change in the Australian constitution that was approved uh, as long ago uh, as 1976, the 21st of May 1976 is the last time Australians voted yes by the requisite majority required by Section 128 of the Australian Constitution. And on the 21st of May 1976, they voted yes to the proposition that Section 72 of the Australian Constitution providing for the appointment of federal judges, judges to federal courts, tribunals, uh, should have the power 
in the federal parliament to enact a retirement age. Uh, and uh, to understand why they did that, it's necessary to go back deeply into ancient history. Now, nobody teaches or almost nobody teaches legal history now. In most universities, you are not taught about the long history that goes before the present time, and I think that's a very bad thing, and I'm going to launch into a personal campaign to restore legal history. Because how can you understand where you are unless you've understood where you came from and how you got there? Um, but uh, the legal history of Australia, um, the history of the um, Australian colonies and states and commonwealths are, uh, in a sense, the product of the legal history of England and of Great Britain and of the English-speaking people, uh, because that's where the steps to develop a legal system uh, that we have in use in Australia really originated in England. And the English legal system originated um, back before uh, 1066, when uh, William the Conqueror came over from France. Uh, I'm not going to go slowly through this. I'm going to take you on a rapid tour of legal history back to 1066. Um, and uh, one of the early kings of England, Henry II, um, was a very imaginative monarch, and he decided that he would establish uh, the law courts in London. There had been courts before, but he decided that he would send the judges of the law courts um, from uh, Westminster uh, out to the provinces in England. And that was a very important and unusual step to take because until then, monarchs generally thought people should come to them rather than their sending their officers to bring justice and law to the whole population of the country, of the realm. And so uh, that's what he did. But the, the judges of his time, and indeed for centuries after it, were basically members of his, um, his uh, royal council. They were, I suppose you would say, relatives, friends and others uh, who were trusted to speak on behalf of the king, who was the font of justice and law, uh, and to decide disputes. Because he reasoned that if you had a system like this, that would be a much safer and more peaceful way to resolve disputes than uh, by um, warfare and uh, battles and uh, uh, all the other methods that had been used until then. Anyway, uh, that's what he did. But because they were within the personal service of the monarch, uh, they uh, held their office during the lifetime of the monarch. And when a monarch died, all of the commissions of the judges uh, were uh, cancelled. That was the end of the judge's service. And it depended on a lot of chance and luck whether the judge would go on to serve the successor monarch. It wasn't automatic. And uh, the, uh, the times led to complaints that this meant that judges were at the will of the monarch instead of being in a permanent position with a guaranteed status uh, that would continue if the monarch died. <clears throat> there were efforts to introduce that system uh, over the centuries, but it really wasn't uh, secured uh, until uh, the Act of Settlement and until, until the revolution that happened in England in, um, in 1688. And when that was settled, the rule was laid down that the monarch's death would not 
terminate the commissions of the judges who that judge had appointed uh, and that those judges who had been appointed would continue to serve quam de you say bene gesserent. That was the Latin phrase. I'm the last generation, I think, of people who at school learned Latin. Quam de you say bene gesserent. Uh, whilst of good behaviour, that was the that was the expression, and uh, therefore the judges became semi permanent. Uh, they held office during good behaviour. That that had a technical meaning, and it meant that they could be removed, but only if they were shown to be incompetent, or if they were shown. Uh, to have been corrupt in some way. And because this was the principle that uh, was adopted by the English monarchs, it was then shared in countries which derived their legal tradition from uh, Great Britain. And one of those countries was us in Australia. Uh, and so when the United States Constitution was adopted, uh, it said that the judges of the federal courts would be appointed by uh, the president and would hold office until and unless they were removed or proved incapacity or misconduct. And those limitations were designed to protect the judges so that they weren't dependent on the will of the monarch uh, or in the American case, on the will of the president, but were giving a status uh, and a permanency to the people who held the office of judge. It was thought that if they're at the whim of the monarch or the president, then that will not be good for the safety of the judge and the courage of the judge to decide cases. It would lead to a great deal of uncertainty uh, as to what happened to the judge uh, if uh, the president of the day took a dislike to them. Uh, and uh, so that was the provision in the American Constitution. Uh, and when uh, the founders of the Australian Commonwealth came to establish our Commonwealth Constitution, they copied substantially in what we call Chapter 3 and what the Americans call Article 3, a provision similar to the United States provision. And it said uh, that judges will be, um, uh, federal judges will be appointed by the Governor General and will hold office unless removed from office or proved incapacity or misconduct uh, decided by resolution of the two Houses of Parliament uh, in the same session. So that's our system, and it's a system that's designed to build in protection for the judge so that they're not subject to the whims of politicians. Um, any of you who tarry with YouTube and watch Mr Trump's travails will realise that that sort of provision has a very important purpose, social purpose, of protecting uh, the uh, judges from opinionated politicians who might take a dislike to them and want to get rid of them. And that was the system they had in the United States and also in Australia. Now, uh, in uh, 1901, the very last act that Queen Victoria, as the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, signed into law was the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act. And she signed Victoria R.I. up the top right-hand corner of the document, and that then became our constitution. Uh, and uh, that constitution had in Section 72 the provision that I've told you, uh, providing that the Governor-General can appoint judges and also providing that Parliament can remove judges. 
uh, and uh, it didn't say anything about the term of the judges. It didn't state and set out, well, the judges can sit for a particular period, 14 years is what they have in South Africa, that when the judges are appointed to the new constitutional court, they hold office, as the German judges do, for a fixed term of years. And in South Africa, it's 14 years, uh, though it can be renewed. Uh, however, in Australia, our constitution said nothing about a term, it said nothing about a birthday, it said nothing about uh, when the judge had to go, uh, and that provision lasted until 1975. Some of you will remember that in 1975, on Remembrance Day, uh, the 11th of November 1975, uh, a very exciting thing happened, constitutionally speaking, in Australia because uh, Governor-General Sir John Kerr dismissed the Whitlam government. And there was then a great deal of unrest. I'm not going to go into that saga, uh, but uh, it led to the defeat of the Whitlam government at the election that followed in December of 1975, and it led to the installation of the, uh, of the Fraser government. And so early in 1976, it became necessary uh, for uh, the uh, new members of the House of Representatives elected in the election at the end of 1975 to be sworn into office. And this is normally done by a, a sitting uh, of the Senate uh, in Canberra and to the Senate comes the Chief Justice or a Justice of the High Court of Australia. Now, the Chief Justice at that time was Sir Garfield Barwick, who had himself been criticised for what role he had played in the Whitlam uh, dismissal. Uh, but that's not relevant to what I want to talk about. Barwick wasn't there because he was in London sitting in the Privy Council because our Chief Justice was ex of, well, he, if he got a commission, he was a Privy Councillor, and that's what Barwick did. He was over in London doing it. So uh, what then happens is that the next most senior justice um, has, is uh, uh, called upon to come to Parliament House and in the presence of the uh, new members of parliament to swear in the new members of the parliament. And the next senior justice of the High Court at that time, in early 1976, uh, was uh, Sir Edward McTiernan. Sir Edward McTiernan uh, was, by that stage, a very old man. In fact, he would have been very close to if he hadn't actually reached the age of 90. And so he was a man who had been appointed in 1930. And so he'd been serving as a Justice of the High Court from 1930 to 1976. And shall we say, when he came along to the Federal Senate, uh, he was seen as somebody uh, upon whom the bloom of youth had long since passed. He was a very, very old man. Um, he was a very distinguished man, but he had a very wavering, wobbly voice, which made it very difficult to understand him. And when I... Uh, appeared in the High Court, which wasn't very often in those days, um, I found it very difficult to understand him because he had this wobbly old voice. And also, he was very frail, as people of 90 can sometimes be. As I begin to approach uh, the last period of the decade I'm in, uh, and as the age of 90 begins to loom in the distance, 
I begin to understand the difficulty of Sir Edward McKinnon. It wasn't his fault, uh, but he had life tenure. There was nothing in the Australian Constitution that said that the judges can be uh, retired at an earlier age and uh, therefore uh, it had been interpreted that that meant that the judges, the justices of the High Court and other federal courts were there for life. And Sir Edward McTiernan was taking that literally and he was there nearly age 90 uh, and um, he was in no way going to give up his seat. Um, and in fact, he lived on for about another six years, uh, but he didn't serve on for another six years because Sir Garfield Barwick, in an act of judicial petulance, uh, when Sir Edward fell over chasing a cockroach in the Windsor Hotel in Melbourne, when he was sitting in Melbourne, uh, when that happened, he fractured his hip, uh, his operation was only partly successful and he needed a ramp to get onto the bench. And Sir Garfield Barwick, rather unkindly, you might think, refused to provide a, ranch, a, a ramp and Sir Edward McTiernan therefore ultimately had to leave, um, not entirely of his own volition but because of the combination of circumstances. But... When the members of parliament came and saw this very, very distinguished and very old man who was there to swear them into office, uh, they were rather shocked. They, did, they saw Barwick occasionally, and he was a sprightly 75-year-old, but they didn't see the other justices, and they no, none of them had probably ever seen certainly not heard, uh, not watched at work, this very old man. And they uh, had to take their oath or affirmation of allegiance and oath or affirmation of office. And they did so, and uh, but they went away from there and uh, they said to each other as they got out of court, do you see how old that man was, how old he is? Why is that? And then people had to explain to them that's because the High Court in 1918 had said because there's no express provision for the retirement or for Parliament to adopt a retirement uh, a provision, uh, it therefore implied that they can stay forever until it, they're good and ready to go. And that led to a groundswell. Well, if you can have a, a groundswell in the Federal Senate of Australia, it's a very, very august body, moves generally rather slowly itself, but it, uh, it, there was a determination that that must not happen, that he uh, should have been subject to a provision uh, that he had to go that the members of parliament were subject to election and if the people, the electors, thought they were too old, they would get rid of them. And uh, it wasn't good enough to have judges in office uh, without any limitation and therefore that they should move to get uh, agreement of both sides that there should be a power in the federal parliament to... Um, provide by law for the retirement of uh, judges. But to do that, they had to overcome this uh, decision of 1918 that had said, it's not there written out and therefore you can't make us go. And you've got to uh, keep us until we're ready to go. And that was the decision in the case called Alexander and Co, which uh, was uh, the case that prevented that uh, legislation being enacted. And that was why, uh, ultimately, in May 1971, there was a constitutional referendum. Uh, as I told you, it's the last referendum in Australia that succeeded. None of the other referenda provisions have been adopted since 1977. Uh, 
the, uh, uh, the constitutional amendment to make Australia a republic failed. It failed in every state. The constitutional provision uh, to make uh, a voice for the Indigenous people, whom we have acknowledged and knifed, that failed. And everything in between had failed. And therefore, uh, they had to put it up to the people, but they put it up to the people, and the people of Australia voted yes. Uh, and they did so because the arguments were, we've got to have a younger judiciary, we've got to have a judiciary with vigour, we've got to have a capacity to, uh, uh, for Parliament to provide a decent time that, like every other public officer, they will go at a certain time not of their own choice. Now, Sir Garfield Barwick uh, uh, disagreed with that provision, uh, but people said, well, he would, wouldn't he? But uh, the people of Australia voted by 80% to uh, provide that Parliament uh, that in the case of the High Court judges, they must go at 70. And in the case of um, uh, other federal judges, they, they must go on the day, not being more than 70, that the Parliament provides. And so that was the provision that went to the vote on the 21st of May 1977, and it was adopted by 80 to 20 per cent. And uh, therefore, that is the provision we have. Now, some people think that that is a bad thing and the end of civilization as we know it. And I know my colleague, Justice McHugh, thinks that the respect for the judiciary has fallen away ever since the judges lost the power to order the execution of prisoners who are found guilty of serious crimes. It's not a view that I personally would hold, but he says that once a judge lost the power over life and death, uh, they had lost a lot of the power they had in the imagination of the people. But also, he thought, and a lot of judges thought, indeed, probably a majority of judges thought, that this requirement that judges should have to go at age 70, uh, and in the case of some federal or lower federal courts earlier, was a very bad thing, a bad thing, because it meant that judges who were people of uh, great capacity and uh, contrib continuing capacity to contribute to the nation and to the constitution and to have the years of service that would command respect, uh, that it was a bad step that was taken. And a lot of people have said to me, well, uh, you would agree with that. Look at you now. You're still going strong and you're still turning up at uh, Charles Sturt University and giving a long lecture uh, and you've still got your marbles. So uh, we, we've lost the benefit of having you serving on the High Court of Australia. Well, my answer to that is too bad. There are plenty of other people, plenty of other lawyers who have great ability they should have their opportunity to serve. And in fact, uh, having the provision that has now been inserted in our constitution ensures that we get generational change uh, in our judiciary. And that is a good thing, in my opinion, because you've got to have people who will reflect the values that are changing. I mean, none of the judges of my generation would have, would have had uh, any experience with mobile phones or emails, or, and I've had to learn all those things, and I'm still trying to get my brain around uh, artificial intelligence. So a lot of things are happening now, technological things, but um, if, you, if there's a will, there's a way, and you can do other exciting and interesting things as I have done. So I have never agreed with Justice McHugh about this. I've never agreed with other judges who've said, this is a terrible thing that we've been deprived of your service. I've had plenty of other things to do. 
and my service is continuing, but um, uh, I think it's a good thing. I voted for it. I'd still vote for it. I think it was a decision uh, that was long overdue, and uh, you could, if you wish to, be unkind, call it the McTiernan Amendment. And if you look at the United States of America today, many of the problems that the Americans are facing are problems that come from the fact that their judges still have life tenure. It's a very bad thing for judges to be around for an indefinite period so that they have the say as to when they go. And uh, I think the experience of the United States uh, is a good illustration of what can go wrong if judges hang on for too long. So that's what I wanted to tell you. It was rather a long version of the story, but unless you know the legal history and how it came about, you won't really appreciate the nuances, and in particular the nuance of Sir Edward McTiernan coming into the Senate, a very old man who horrified the uh, senators and the members of the House of Representatives and led to the last amendment that the people of Australia uh, adopted. Um, it is a question as to why Australians are so um, reluctant to change their constitution. Uh, but the last change that they adopted was the, one might say, unkind change to tell judges that at a certain age their time is up and they have to go and do other things. And I think that was a good decision of the people of Australia in their wisdom. So that's my talk, and I think I deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> and then we'll have... And please don't complain about the length of talk. I was told I had to talk for three quarters of an hour, and that's what I've done. And uh, uh, now we have time for questions. If you have a burning question on international commercial arbitration, uh, you can ask that question now, but, or any question on what I've said or anything else, or if there are any law students with questions for their essays or exams, they can also slip those in. But thank you very much for having me tonight. Well, Q&A, how are we going to do this? Are you going to... I'm going to stay where I am. You're going to stay where you are. And anyone in the room who wants to ask a question can raise their hands and there'll be a roving mic taken to them. We've been harvesting questions from the Q&A online uh, as well, so we will blend some of those questions into the Q&A session. Um, Mr Kirby did say earlier on in a dangerous way that he would be pre prepared to answer almost any question that he's prepared to answer on any topic, not only this topic or the interesting topic of international commercial arbitration. So um, it's open slather, really, um, and we can take some questions from the floor first and then move to um, the the Q&A online. So, Acting Vice-Chancellor, I think you have the prerogative to ask the first question. Thank you. Um, that, that was really fascinating and, and aside from anything, a good um, argument in favour of the reinstating of legal history um, in, in the legal curriculum. Um, as you were talking, though, I was reflecting that um, the UK, of course, doesn't have a constitution um, and indeed recently changed the retirement ages of judges upwards to the far more respectable age of 75, simply by ministerial diktat. It didn't even need a law, let alone a constitutional change. And so I was reflecting on what you were talking about and what's been in very much in the background, the failure to vote for voice last year. And I wondered what your perspectives were on where the right balance lies in terms of how hard you make it to change a constitution. So, you know, one of the, uh, Taiwan, I believe, has a constitution where 50% plus one of eligible voters, and they don't have compulsory voting, have to vote to change the constitution, which means they will never change the constitution uh, because they don't have compulsory voting, versus the sort of UK type system where these changes can be made overnight because there isn't even really a written constitution. Where does the right balance lie in, in constitutions? Well, uh, the UK 
is an unusual case in that, as you say, it, 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 it's not true to say it doesn't have a constitution, but its constitution is in lots of uh, acts of parliament and um, uh, international uh, treaties that have been adopted and uh, decisions of uh, the ministers and subordinate decisions. So it's a mess, but they do have a constitution. I may, I may be wrong, but I thought the uh, UK uh, introduced changes in judicial tenure by legislation, and uh, it may have been just a ministerial decision, but it would have had to be made under a power that the minister had. Uh, but uh, originally, the UK changed uh, the d date of retirement to um, 68, and then it subsequently put it up. And in New South Wales, uh, our parliament, which is not uh, in this respect subject to the federal constitution, our parliament uh, initial, initially provided that judges must retire at 70. That's where the 70 came from New South Wales and other states into the federal constitution. Uh, but... Um, uh, since then, uh, as I was reminded tonight by a distinguished Australian judge from the Supreme Court uh, who is here, um, the, uh, the time of retirement in the states in New South Wales and in Victoria has been upped from 70, which it was uh, when I was serving on the uh, Court of Appeal of New South Wales, uh, it's gone up to 75. Uh, and in Canada, it has long been 75. So for those who hanker for very old judges, uh, then you can say uh, you were going to change it to 75. And I can understand that decision. Personally, I wouldn't favour it. I think the judiciary is already, in terms of its values and philosophy, a very conservative group of people. And uh, therefore, on the whole, um, I think it's better to give them a little bit of a stimulus to go uh, because there will always be very clever people coming along who should uh, have an opportunity to serve and particularly to secure changes. For example, changes in the number of women judges. Uh, if you've got the same old group staying on for very long times, then you can't make those changes because people are in office. And even in the case of the Australian constitutional provision that I've explained, it was made only prospective. In other words, it didn't get rid of those who already had life tenure. And so Garfield Barlick uh, clung on to uh, his office as Chief Justice of Australia until about the age of uh, 78, I think, because he was he had diabetes and he was losing his capacity to read and therefore he decided then that the time was up for him to go. But um, uh, there are plenty of talented people around and uh, in some professions, we've got to have a shake up and we've got to change. Uh, I tell you one profession, uh, and I go to a lot of conferences, uh, that um, is very unbalanced, and that's in the information technology profession. All men, the conferences you go to of information technology experts, you know, it, it's something like 80% males. And I don't know why this is so, because there's nothing on the Y chromosome that means that women can't uh, do computer technology. Um, and I went to my old school in Sydney, Fort Street High School today, and there were three people talking to the students about leadership. I was one of them, and you could imagine I was giving the message of stirring things up. And uh, the other was uh, David Anderson, who is the general manager of the ABC. Uh, and he had a very important job in Australia, the national broadcaster, and the third was uh, Dr. Um, uh, Shiva 
Lingnam, uh, who was a refugee from uh, Sri Lanka, Tamil refugee who fled the, the revolution in Sri Lanka, and she is a top neurosurgeon. Uh, and she said when she arrived uh, at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and finished her degree, um, the number of women neurosurgeons uh, you could count on the fingers of one hand. And it is changing, but it takes a lot of time for these things to change. And sometimes you've got to give it a bit of a help. That's why I, I, I uh, want to propound a practical and really, you might say, political or philosophical uh, reason we should change the the time of service of people who have the power to make decisions affecting uh, all of us and who have the great responsibilities. Um, and I, I don't say that applies so clearly to a neurosurgeon, though I, I would think that maybe it does. But um, it was wonderful to see uh, this neurosurgeon she would be about age 35 or 36, and she's now one of the top neurosurgeons in Australia and works at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. So you, if you've got any brain problems, that's to say uh, problems that can be fixed up by surgery, um, then uh, she would be one of those who would have the responsibility. A very clever woman, and no reason why there shouldn't be more women as neurosurgeons, and that's what she told the class of young students in public schools from all over the Sydney district this morning, today. I'm not content to make one speech in a day. I come to, to make two. Any other questions? More opportunities now. Plenty of questions in the, the room. I'm going to take one question online and then come to some questions in the room. Um, as a student starting to study international law as a mandatory subject this session at university, what, if any, different mindsets do you need uh, to do well in international law and understand international law compared to the typical traditional priestly 11 subjects that are not international law? Well, that's a good question. And in fact, it's a rather controversial question in the context of the decisions of the High Court of Australia. Um, I have always been of the view that in our legal system, um, we have to keep stability, but also we've got to move with the change. And one of the big changes that we all would know is the change of uh, internationalism, international technology, international institutions, international law. And so... Um, the answer I would give uh, is that uh, this view of mine is not yet uh, fully adopted, though it was adopted by the High Court in the Marbo case because it was in the Marbo case that Justice Brennan said uh, the provision in our law that we do not recognise the land rights of Indigenous people uh, was made by judges and can be unmade by judges. And the one principle of, um, of uh, international human rights law uh, that is uh, universal is that you cannot deprive people of their rights because of their race. And that became the key that unlocked the door, that opened the opportunity in the Marbo case for um, uh, dealing with the lack of rights of Indigenous people. That passage in Justice Brennan's decision, I will mention for the sake of this student, the questioner, is at 175 Commonwealth Law Reports, page 1 at 42, because that is where Justice Brennan says the one principle that international law speaks clearly and unanimously on is that you cannot deprive people of basic rights by reference to their, uh, their um, age. And I normally have with me 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, an international instrument. I always keep it in my pocket because you'd be amazed at what wisdom you can find out of it. The first article of the Universal Declaration, which was given to me at Summerhill OC class in the year 1949, because it was adopted in December 48, the one, the first principle is wonderful. The language in English is wonderful. All persons are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's the sort of core notion of this, and that was the principle that Justice Brennan introduced in the Mabo decision, and that was done by the help of international law. Okay, next. Uh, thank you for that, Justice Kirby, your entire speech. Um, I was privileged as a student to first hear you speak at Sydney Town Hall in 2001. Um, yes, <laughs> you won't remember, but I do. Um, and, you know, even talking to friends today saying I was coming to hear you speak, they said they remembered, you know, what a wonderful speech you gave and how much it had impacted us as students um, and that reputation that you carried and other justices carry throughout, you know, their career as judges but also after, which leads me to wonder, um, you've mentioned the United States and the schmozzle that's going on over there, but I wonder what the politicisation of courts, especially the Supreme Court in the United States, which is the most sort of publicised court in the world, um, what that does for the dignity of the judiciary as a whole and can we recover from that? Well, first of all, the dignity of the judges is less important than the wisdom of what they do. Uh, and um, the Constitution is a political document. It deals with big political questions about the country and its governments. And you can't get away from the politics of judging constitutional questions. It's just part of the job. What is not permissible is being political in terms of a political party. Um, and in our tradition in Australia and in England and in Canada and in New Zealand and in most of the English-speaking countries, um, judges have nothing to do with politicians. They don't meet them. They don't uh, telephone them. They don't have friendships with them. Uh, in the High Court, when we'd finished a week of work, and it was an arduous week, we would go to Canberra Airport and by arrangements which was ma were made by uh, the High Court, a special room was set aside for us so that we could be in this room and not be buttonholed by the politicians. And that's very important, and I, I approved of that, not because I thought I was better or more important than the politician, but the politicians have uh, to be have their ear close to the people and listening to what people are saying, and, and uh, the experience is that if you don't separate them, they might... Uh, power is corrupting, and they might try to corrupt... Uh, not in a money sense, but corrupt the mind and the thinking and the um, and the legal reasoning of judges. So I wouldn't be too worried about the politics of decisions. What is a little unsettling in the United States is that they divide down the line and uh, on the abortion issue, for example, although that does raise very large questions of policy, uh, the question was whether they continued to follow a decision which had been laid down and which gave people certain basic rights um, for more than 50 years. And uh, that uh, was divided down the line. Those who had been appointed by Republican uh, presidents all voted uh, to terminate uh, the right to abortion as resting in the Constitution and the three justices who had been appointed by Democrat presidents, they uh, took a different view. So that 
tends to make it look as though they have uh, had a political, uh, uh, party political differentiation as distinct from political philosophical uh, views. I hope that's reasonably clear. We have a lot of difficult questions in the chat online, which I may seek some answers from you, Mr Kirby, over the next day or two and send some replies back to our audience. Um, You're going to send me more emails. And possibly, uh, possibly. Um, I've got to answer them as quickly uh, as you send them. So quickly, one question is um, what is your view on the need for a Bill of Rights in the Australian Constitution? That's a simple and short question uh, for you. And then we'll go to some questions in the audience. Well, uh, it won't come as a surprise that because I go to bed with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, it's something that I think we should have in our constitution. Um, in fact, there have been studies of um, the knowledge by students at school of the fundamental principles of human rights and those studies have shown that in Massachusetts, in the United States, students have much more knowledge about and much more capacity to think about and talk about basic rights of citizenship. And that's an important aspect that we're missing out on. So I'm in favour of a national constitutional charter of rights. Virtually every other country in the whole world has a constitutional charter of rights. So what's so wonderful about Australia? What is so perfect about our governance? Why have we not ever done anything that offends fundamental human rights, that we wouldn't be helped by having some basic principles? But I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see that happen. And therefore, I don't lose too much sleep about it. The real question, which is on the agenda, and there's going to be a big conference in Sydney next week about human rights, is whether we should have a charter of rights. That's one that was enacted by federal parliament or state parliaments, and whether that is a sort of step in the right direction, which may be easier to get. Very hard to change the Australian constitution. We saw that recently with The Voice. Very hard to change it. And that isn't always um, a bad thing. Uh, when Dr. Evatt won the case in the High Court about banning the Communist Party in 1951, the Menzies government had enacted the Communist Party Dissolution Act, and Dr. Evatt challenged that in the High Court and the High Court struck it down and said it's unconstitutional. You've got plenty of power to deal with um, uh, communists for what they do, but you can't deal with them for what they think. That belongs to them, and Parliament's power doesn't extend to that. A very good decision, and it saved us in Australia from going down the path of South Africa and other countries, uh, and I therefore support that. But um, I do think a charter would be a good thing. And I think uh, that's what's going to be debated next week. And you may see some publicity to this. And that may put pressure on the politicians in Parliament to uh, adopt a charter of rights. Uh, Justice Kirby, thank you uh, for presenting to tonight. It's, uh, it's been an honour for all of us to, uh, to listen to you. Um, I was uh, reflecting on on your argument tonight, and I uh, found it persuasive uh, in many ways. But I can think of at least a couple of reasons why it would be a good idea to have uh, at least some older justices, perhaps only one. Um, one would be uh, to represent uh, the older cohort of Australians and and their perspectives. Another reason is um, that there is wisdom in the generations that there are some periods of, of life that, you know, older people have gone through that younger uh, justices would not have, and that really shapes uh, their values, their understanding, their knowledge. What, what I wondered was whether um, an alternative strategy might have been to uh, 
be in the military you have a certain number of years to be promoted and if you don't get say to brigadier by a certain point you're out i i wondered whether there was a place for um you know a uh, a judge that could be between 70 and 75 years of age uh, just that would hold those perspectives and could advise uh you know from that perspective but you know you have an opportunity to get to that position but at 75 you move on but it's only one person so there's still the new justices coming along but there is provision for the representation of uh from senior oh, justices <clears throat> thank you for the question uh, i've already said that i won't go into battle about extending it to 75 uh, because we're all living longer and therefore not all but uh, people on the whole are living longer ages because of improvements in medical care and so on um uh, but uh Judges don't advise, judges decide and order, and therefore they're part of governance, they're part of power. And um, uh, how would you change this? You can't have different qualifications for judges, I don't think. You can't have, say, well, one of them is going to be over the age and one of them is going to be... Um, uh, a um, an Indigenous people person or one of them is going to be... Um, a, a Catholic, or you, it doesn't happen that that the politicians who appoint the judges keep those matters in into consideration. But don't be too worried about judges getting judges who are old to get to a position in the High Court. Generally speaking, you have had to serve for many years on a high state or federal court. And therefore, in the nature of things, you are generally not going to get there until you are in your uh, late 60s or 70s. Uh, I, got, I was appointed to the High Court in, 2000, uh, in 1996 uh, when I was 46. And uh, therefore, I had 13, 14 years to serve. So generally, people don't don't um, uh, you don't have to worry about looking after people who are old, but the judges of the High Court are not necessarily going to have a lot of experience with the problems of the aged. They'll have experience with their own lives, and their own lives will include the ailments and uh, conditions, but they're not going to include such questions of homelessness or lovelessness or all the other problems that we see with uh, older people in our society today. So I don't, it's not easy, but I don't think uh, that having a differential criterion is going to help. I think it has to be a basic uh, time qualification, a basic experience in the courts before you uh, appointed to the High Court, and that itself is just going to ensure that uh, they don't um, get there too late. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that we are now getting many more women in the judiciary <clears throat> is a very good development that has happened in my lifetime. So the politicians are under pressure to respond to the popular will for the type of composition of the judiciary that should be adopted. And they tailor their appointments with that in mind, I think. I'll sneak in one more online question and then we may have to wrap up. Um, do you find that Australia's constitutional amendment mechanism under Section 128 of the Constitution is too stringent? Well, it certainly is very stringent and uh, there have been 45 proposals for the change of the Australian Constitution. And after a recount, I think it's uh, eight have been adopted. It's, it's a very small number. Uh, it was copy, copied uh, in the 1890s from Switzerland. Uh, in Switzerland, they had a provision that you had to get a majority of the people nationwide in favour but also a majority of people in the cantons, in other words, the states. 
And that's what we've got. It's got to be a double majority. It's got to be the majority of the people as a whole, but then reflecting the fact that we are a continental country of huge size with different communities on one side of uh, this massive country to the other, uh, there is this provision you've got to carry it with a majority of the um, uh, of the states. And uh, that has been the difficulty, um, that getting the nationwide majority has sometimes happened, but they didn't get the majority in the smaller states. And the smaller states are part of Australia, and therefore they... Uh, they demand uh, and expect that they will be given respect and uh, opportunities to uh, re be reflected in the makeup of the law that is their constitution. Um, so um, these are not easy questions, but they're not all that difficult either in comparison to being a neurosurgeon and somebody who's cutting away at your brain and, and fixing up uh, your neurological problems. I think being a judge and a justice of the High Court was relatively easy. In fact, my brother, David Kirby, was a judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. His life was different from mine because he uh, was in charge of trials, like Judge Marchand, the judge who is currently trying uh, Donald Trump. And so David sits in... He, or he, when he was a judge of the Supreme Court, he sat in day after day after day of murder trials. Really difficult, very difficult cases, I think. Uh, in fact, I think more difficult than the cases I had, which had already been through two levels of very clever judges on the way. So uh, I, I think the job of a judge is very difficult, but... The people who are chosen on the whole are people who are not corrupted. When I got delegations from Indonesia or other countries, I would always say the proudest thing I can say is, you see that phone over there? I've never had a telephone call from a minister saying, well, Your Honour, we would appreciate, the government would appreciate uh, this or that. Never. And I never got a brown paper envelope with a lot of cash in it. Never. So we've got things to be grateful for, and those things tend to be part of our inheritance from England. Uh, it's a tradition which has its weaknesses and tends to be conservative, but in the matter of uh, integrity and independence, it's pretty good. And, and that certainly was my experience, and I believe... It is to the protection of the people of Australia that that is our case, and we must keep it that way. End of lecture. End of long talk. Big round of applause. Thank you, the Honourable Michael Kirby, for your wisdom and inspiration tonight. Um, thank you for your judicial service up to the age of 17, and thank you for everything you continue to do after that age as well. For myself as a criminal lawyer, I've invoked your verbatim judgments in front of students on many occasions. That has ranged from your comments on the extended common purpose doctrine, chapter three, right through to your attacks on the attempts to extend the provocation defence um, to include the homosexual advance defence. Your judicial work that you have done continues to appeal to the future and your post-judicial work continues to be further inspiration for us as well. Thank you to your husband, Mr. Johan von Floten, for being here tonight, for driving you down here from Sydney safely today, and the inspiration that your relationship of more than half a century has actually provided to many um, of us. Coffee, tea and biscuits await outside for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kirby, Mr. von Floten, and also Professor Blake will be here till about 7.50 tonight if you'd like to have some further interactions um, with them tonight. And thank you all for this wonderful event and for participating tonight. Thanks. Thank you.